Okay, everyone. I guess um, we'll get going here. Um, yeah, this is like a um, great crowd for the morning because um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here for the third day of the James Welch Literary Festival. And um, particularly um, Sasha, because um, I know how hard it is being here at 10 in the morning. It was like last night we're hitting out because so our panel's at 11. No, it's at 10. And you got to be there at 9.30 for an hour. He's like, looks at us. It's like, do we look like morning people? I was like, look at both of us. I was like, no, we don't actually. I mean, we're not. So so thank you for being here, particularly Shasa. And you look vibrant. So um, so this is a, um, the nonfiction panel. I'm not sure the official name, but yeah, nonfiction and is it memoir too? I think it says in there. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm very um, glad to get these writers in particular here. They bring a, a perfect um, whatever rounding out of experiences and stuff. So um, so I'll introduce uh, Chris, the gentleman here to my left. Uh, Chris Latre is a Matisse storyteller and enrolled member of the Little Shell Chippewa tribe of Chippewa Indians. He's the author of One Sentence Journal, Short Poems and Essays from the World at Large, 2018 by Riverfeet River Press, and descended from a travel-worn satchel. And a third book, Becoming Little Shell, will be published by Milkweed Editions in spring 2023. He lives in Missoula, Montana. And where is... I'm trying to find your bio. Um, not a morning person. I'm trying to find. <laughs> but they're here. Um, okay, there you are. Sasha Lapointe. What, what's your middle name? Um, Taksha Blue. That's cool. Oh, the point is from the upper Sk Sk Skagit and Nooksack Indian tribe. She holds a double MFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and Creative Nonfiction and Poetry. Um, just there's like some students and stuff from the in Institute of American Indian Arts that are running around. So I'd like to give a shout out to them. I was like, so anyways, um, her memoir Red Paint received a starred review from Kirkus was named the best new book of the month in March 22 by Time Magazine, so it's blowing up, and has received praise from several outlets, including Miss Magazine and the LA Times. Her poetry collection, Rose Quartz, is forthcoming from Melkweed in 2023. Um, yeah, and a funny story. He's like, I got a starred review from Kirkus, and I didn't know what that meant. And it was like, only one star? And I was like, no, that's a good thing. So it's like really hard to get a star review from Kirkus because I did reviews from, they want you to be very strict about it. And I, it was a kind of a rare thing to even give star reviews. So I mean, if you didn't get any, but um, okay. And this is uh, one of my favorite women, uh, nonfiction memoirists too as well, is uh, Susan Devon Hardest. And not just because we're both from uh, Billings, but um, but um, born on the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes reservations, Susan Devon Harness was adopted out to a white family. She is the award-winning author of Bitterroot, a Salish memoir of transracial adoption. She has spoken on the topic of Ted Ek TEDx Mile High and on numerous podcasts. She holds graduate degrees in cultural anthropology and creative nonfiction from. Colorado State University, where she is an affiliate of the Department of Anthropology and Geography. Um, I guess that would be a good point, or with uh, Susan being on her ancestral homelands. Um, I, there's a story I always say that uh, I said this yesterday at the beginning of a two spirit panel, but yeah, it's like one of the things that always sticks out was this uh, conceptual artist, I think he calls himself Kirk. Corky Irwin is a Salish artist, and he did this uh, art project, and it was, um, I think, but not moccasin footprints, moccasin footprints overlaid over each other the whole time. And he's like, this represents our land. 
the Salish land. For 10,000 years, we've been in this bitter root valley. So each, each time you've taken a step, our ancestors have uh, stepped here before, so acknowledge that. And I was like, huh, that's pretty powerful. Because uh, at first I was like, 10,000 years, that's a long time. But that was like basically the end of the Ice Age when this cleared up, and that's when they settled here. So been here a long time, so your peoples. <laughs> okay, um, I'll get right into a really, really intense question with uh, Susan. So. We will start with Susan. So. Susan, your book about transracial adoption highlights a lot of the unspoken things people that are native and adopted out to white families go through with such brutal honesty. Being one of the few native children at a white school in 1970s Billings, Montana, the feeling of constantly feeling like an outsider, um, sexual abuse, your adopted mom and her struggle with mental illness as you lived alone, and just a plethora of experiences that include deans of just making up your own past as a little kid. So many tragic and powerful experiences. In your first chapter, it reads, quote, Adoption, by the very act of itself, is defined by tragedy. Death, the inability to be a parent, as in the case of my birth mother, and in my case, the inability to be a whole and complete child. People don't want to discuss tragedy, including my mom, end quote. So... What was the pivotal moment for you that when you decided these experiences needed to be shared? So, um, oh. oh, it might not be on too. So. Is it easier to pull it off? Okay. 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 Everybody can hear me. <laughs> I am so non-tech savvy. <laughs> um, so, what was the, the what was the last what was the last thing you wanted me to to What did you want me to answer? Okay, so what was the, when did you, what was the pivotal moment for you when you said I must write this? This is what people need to know about this. Your so I I. What happened with me is I turned somewhere into my 40s. And at that point, I started feeling really angry because I began to realize that, you know, identity, I kept hearing identity, especially in the psychological circles, is I was, I had an identity problem. I was the one with the identity problem. And I started thinking, you know what? I'm not the person with the identity problem. Like society has the problem with me because I'm not easily labeled. I'm, I don't fit any place where they feel I should. And at that point, I enrolled at Colorado State University. So I'm one of those um, non-traditional students and I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> I enrolled in Colorado State University in the anthropology department, and I just went up one day and just said, have I got a study for you? And I was able to, um, to talk with a lot of transracial adoptees, American Indian transracial adoptees, about their experiences. And the one thing I found out is we don't talk. We don't talk about it because it's shameful. It's embarrassing to not belong. And it's really embarrassing if you try to go back to your tribe and your tribe doesn't acknowledge you. And so um, I remember when I was talking with a woman to see if she would participate, I just said, well, the reason that I'm interested in talking with you is because I'm, I'm an American Indian transracial adoptee. And she said, then you know what it's like. And to me, that was a really, really powerful statement. And um, so I did the study, and um, it's published. So if you're doing research on transracial adoption, it's out there. The uh, thing is, is that when you do research, everything is faceless, right? You, you get rid of names. You get rid of identities. You hide people. 
And I kept thinking, you know, I want to put a face to this story. I really need to put a face to this story um, so that people can relate. And um, I, I thought about using some of the stories that I'd, I'd been given, but, you know, they were so full of tragedy. I kept thinking, those aren't my stories to tell. And then I um, tried to get a documentary, but I'm not a good salesperson. And the documentarian was like, oh, poor you. You grew up and you had like a great family and you are educated and, you know, you're safe. Like, oh, you poor thing. And um, so at that point, I just thought, okay, well, if I'm going to tell this story, then, then I'll be the person um, that tells the story. And it, that was the pivotal moment. Thank you. Um, just a quick uh, reiteration on that. Okay, so this one time I was in this uh, this uh, pretty intensive treatment, and there's like a 25, two dozen people in there, and I, there was something that really struck out to me that um, it was like a, some uh, native kid, or he was a kid, 20 something to me, but anyways, I feel like an anti sometimes, but um. Anyways, uh, he was he was like saying, you know, I was adopted out, you know, by this and raised really well, kind of wealthy white family and stuff. But he just felt like there's always this constant sense of abandonment. He had four brothers and sisters that, and he was the one that was adopted out. There's always this question, nagging question, why, why, why did they give me up but kept them, you know? And and he had to go back eventually and deal with that. And it was like a really hard thing, but. But he's like, you know, I'm appreciative. I know that my parents love me and this and that. I'm not going to say they're not my parents. But, you know, it was still that nagging feeling. But remember the counselor asked that group of, like, 25 people. He's like, so um, you're not alone in this because um, how many of you people here have uh, been adopted out, been raised in foster families, or not raised by your birth parents? And it was so weird because half the hands went up. So, so it's like something that really does haunt people and stuff and having known those people pretty well it was just like it really did put a face to it anyway uh okay now we'll go to you sasha um you've had quite the whirlwind year with your book red paint the ancestral autobiography of a coast sailor's punk it's been a smashing success um you're even on time magazine's book of the month what was that in march or something and then uh, like your um, starred Kirkus review, which is a good thing. And um, so congrats on all your success. So as a true punk, do you feel like a sellout now? <laughs> There's a flip on that. Um. Is that a real question? I mean, I love this yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can talk about just, like, what's it yeah. been like? Were you expecting that success? And I was like, has it been a... I was not expecting it. But um, I think it's an interesting um, idea of... Because I do think of, like, the underground music scene that I was so enmeshed in growing up. And that's such a real element in punk, specifically. That's, like, if you get signed to a label, you're a sellout. You're a poser. You're no longer relevant. Um, but, and I think of that in it, how that's so different from the book coming into the world. I think that um, rather than being like, oh, you're a sellout, I think that it actually stays true to my punk roots, like having wrestled these hard memories into art on the page. Um, so no, I don't feel like a sellout. <laughs> okay. okay, and um, I, I was just going to kind of riff off the question I asked um, Susan. Um, that being said, what made you decide to just forge ahead and wrap up all this, um, all the Salish women you've known and experiences you've had and, you know, just write your heart out about them? And why is it important for you to hire your experiences as someone, you know, to even include it in the title, the uh, punk in the title? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... People are like, wow, that's interesting. That's why I, I think that's part of it. It's like Salish and punk, and it's just kind of catchy, and they grab it. So, Yeah, um, I think this feels like a two-part question, so I'm going to try to focus. Um, but I think the why, the first part was the why, right? Like why I... Yeah, why, why, what made you 
This uh, is important, yeah. Yeah, um, I think growing up, I learned from a very young age the power of stories. Um, our grandmother told us stories um, growing up and the stories were always really active and they were healing and they were lessons. And I knew that um, in writing my story, I, I would think back to 13 year old me out in the trailer on the reservation in Swinomish, like an hour and a half outside of Seattle and thinking about the kind of story that I needed. Um, I wish that I had had um, some sort of story that I could see myself reflected back. So I knew that the importance of sharing, so maybe like there's some 14 year old little wannabe riot girl out on the res, like reading my book. Um, and then the idea of adding punk into the title um, is layered for me. I think that, you know, I did seek um, sanctuary and family in punk as like a teen runaway and I fell in love with the underground music scene and I sort of tried to supplement like this idea of family and safety there but also I think um, uh, someone asked me a really cool question about the book focuses so much on my lineage on my Coast Salish ancestry specifically the women of my lineage and the question was something like, well, how do you align them with this idea of punk? And I was like, whoa, that's the coolest question ever, because I think my grandma's one of the punkest people I know. <laughs> and in that, I mean, she dedicated her, her life's work to the revitalization of our language. Um, when she saw it disappearing, she, you know, dedicated her work to to actively like keeping it from disappearing and fighting against this idea of erasure and oppression and like the colonizer's language kind of erasing ours. And I think that's super punk. Thank you. All righty. Um, okay, Chris, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, so, um, <laughs> I, we know you're probably eager to talk about your latest projects, um, but your one book that kind of um, won a, like, I know it won a High Plains Book Award, and another word, um, the One Sentence Journal. So, but can you explain the concept of One Sentence Journal? I just knew, I mean, I know, what made you, and why you made writing one sentence summarizing each day a habit? Sure. Um, so, you know, maybe a decade ago, a little longer than that, and for 13 years, I was a, a manufacturing consultant. And so what that meant is I traveled around the country helping people make decisions about data collection on shop floor manufacturing, which is about as interesting as it probably sounds as I relate to it. <laughs> and, and through all of that time, you know, I, I, I wanted to write. We were talking earlier about, uh, before we started, you know, I graduated from Frenchtown High School and my buddies and I moved to Seattle to be rock stars. And the plan was, is that we were going to be, I was going to be a rock star and I was going to write books like when you didn't have anything else to do on the tour bus. And, and that's a similar experience with, for Sasha and I, only the difference now is that, you know, I still play music, but now it's the writing. So I fit the music in around the writing process. But while I was doing this other job, you know, the, the fallback job that I kind of backed myself into, I would often find myself either while I was on a trip somewhere or the couple days I would have at home before I had to leave again without the energy to really write as we're always told we need to write. You need to do, you know, ass in the chair for a thousand words a day or whatever that bullshit is. And I just determined that, you know, I want to write at least one sentence every day so that I feel like I practiced my craft that day, even if it was just one sentence. Because one sentence, you do that every day, and it starts to pile up. And I carry these little field notes, notebooks, and I should have brought it here so that I could product placement it for my buddy Draplin. But that's literally what it was. It was literally one sentence every day just to feel like I was doing something. And then... I read a book of poetry called Braided Creek, A Conversation in Poetry, which was written by Jim Harrison and Ted Couser. And it was a collection of short poems that they were mailing on postcards, like snail mail, while Ted Couser was, was recovering from cancer treatment. So he had kind of lost his will to write. 
and and was instructed by his doctors to stay out of direct sunlight. So he would go out on these early morning walks and through the course of taking his dogs out in the Nebraska freezing cold, which I know to some of us, um, to me, that's like as romantic as I can imagine, you know, like, you know, re-kickstarting your writing career out in the frigid darkness of, of Nebraska, you know? So he started writing these little poems on postcards and he would mail them to Jim Harrison, who would then respond in type, you know, and, and send another one back. And uh, Copper Canyon Press collected these. They didn't identify who wrote what, but it was just these short little two to six line poems. And when I read that book, I just kind of had this epiphany, like if I go through and kind of recapitulate my sentences, add some creative line breaks and, and maybe rewrite a couple things here and there, they would look like they would be related to what these two other guys were doing. And, and that's what it was. I never had, it's not like I was writing anything because I had a plan to write a book or anything. It was like an idea and then six months later it was a book. So it was very organic, very unplanned, and I think that's part of why it's been successful is because it was absolutely with, you know, I figured I'd be 50 copies sold and my mom would buy 40 of them, you know. And, you know, that was four years ago, and it's just worked out. Okay, yeah, and um, I just kind of want to illustrate why it was so popular. Um, so, so I do have one of your one sentences. It was very difficult to transcribe. Just kidding. Um, so it says, while much of your sentences seem to be guided upon seeing the beauty of life and all of its smallest moments, there's a particular sentence that really strikes out. And you said this is one of your favorite ones. It goes... Okay, this is Chris's words. Uh, I am a fat, barely employable, middle-aged native guy with a chip on his shoulder and no health insurance, living before, below the poverty line with huge love for much and many. And you can believe I have a stake in this. Can you discuss the emotion you felt while writing those words? Thank you. I literally wrote that the morning after the Trump election in 2016. And I had no, I was working downtown at Fact and Fiction, who have a table back here where you can buy all these books. They've been kind enough to provide the greasy commerce aspect of this festival. But I was working there the morning after, and it was, and people were, were coming in with just these expressions of, what the fuck? <laughs> Literally. And it was, it, Charles, you might have even been one of them who rolled through there that morning. It was, it was like a funeral. And I didn't know, I'm getting emotional. Because it was very community-based, just like this, right? It's like we're coming together to try and figure out what we've just done to ourselves. And that was my response. Because I do have a stake in this. We all have a stake in this, in everything that has happened since, which we are still reeling from, you know, that presidency, a pandemic, now there's a new one coming, just all of it. We all have a stake in it. And that was, that was my response. Thank you, Adrian, for making me freaking cry. <laughs> it's, what a, it's what a goths do, so that's something we're really going to... Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, here's a question for, particularly for Susan and Sasha, but now that um, Chris has cried, he could do it too, but um, it, it, because it deals with um, the trauma you wrote about. How do you prepare yourself to write such intense um, memories you had to revisit and turn them into art? Because you said, you know, because you're off dealing with real life people. So how do you just go ahead and write about these real life people, including the ones you love, without feeling like they might get upset at you or like feel like they're looking over your shoulder? You can go first, Susan. I've really now I've really messed this up. <laughs> <laughs> um well, okay, so first, I drank a lot of wine, <laughs> and I waited until my parents were passed. Um, that, that was probably 
The easiest thing I could do because, because any relationship is complicated. And, you know, when you adopt a child, there are all these hopes and there are all these dreams and there are all these, you know, ideas that you have. And, and especially when we get into our, into our teen years, we, we don't talk to our parents about what's painful. We don't talk to our parents about what we wished they'd do. You know, you just get up in the morning and get through with it, and you're happy to see your friends, and you just stuff it down. Um, that's, you know, the good old American way, just stuff it down. Um, but that was, that was, for me, I, I really had to do a lot of revisiting. Um, with my book, it made it a little bit easier because it's, it's, it's a series of essentially braided essays. So I hop back and forth between the historical person I was and the person I am today. And so for me, that was really helpful to, to come back, to not live in that space. And, and I will say there's a lot of them, um, there's a lot of adoption groups that I've just kind of walked away from because they really want me to live in that space and I don't want to be there. You know, this book, this book was there. I don't, I don't need to live there forever. Oh, thank you. That's a great answer. Um, yeah. Do you need to re repeat the question? I don't think so. I'm okay. going to give it a, give it a stab here. Um, I'm with Susan. There was wine. There was, there was wine involved. Um, but on a, a, in a serious way, I think that, um, when I first attempted to bring these memories and trauma to the page, I failed miserably. And I feel like I'm sort of the poster child of what not to do. Um, because in, in, my, in Red Paint, I reference um, the first manuscript, uh, Little Boats, when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts and um, wanted to leave with a, a finished manuscript, and I did. But I was really reckless with how I approached that. I didn't know the amount of support I would need, the the sort of the ground to stand on. I just kind of recklessly like started barreling through these memories, and in doing so, I came really undone. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I didn't know what was happening. I wasn't even in therapy. Like it was so um, chaotic and hard, and uh, I put that it was like some 400 and something pages um, and I just put it away realizing that I was having flashbacks, I was fainting, I, I really was unwell and so I took a huge break and in that break I learned a lot about healing. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, like I, I failed at writing trauma at first which I think is important and more people should talk about it um, because I think that we have to be careful when we go back into these spaces. Um, and I love what Susan said about like the, the like having it exist there, but we don't have to live in that forever. Um, and so did that even answer your question? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it did, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I wanna ask a follow up to that question um, because and, and I'm going to preface with this little story. I was driving over the bridge here the other day, and there was one of those rubber bungee cords, you know, with a hook on each end laying in the middle of the road. And as I'm passing by, I immediately hear my dad's voice. I'll pull over. I can use that. <laughs> and and I, th I think about that. I, I think about the ways that my dad's voice is often negative, but is often very positive. And as Indian people, I feel like one of those expectations is for us to write about our trauma. And it's certainly a part of the book that I have coming out, and it's obviously a part of your books. But I think when we talk about it, I think we also have to address what, what did we find positive that we're carrying from our ancestors as we go back and we learn where we came from and where our families came from. And I would just like one little anecdote from both of you of something that you uncovered that you are happy to hear that little voice telling you to pull over and recognize moving forward. Is that cool? So could you guys, can you do that for me, please? 
Um, and I love this question so much because I think oftentimes there is this expectation to only hover in the painful and in the, the heart, the trauma. And um, I discovered so much in writing Red Paint. Um, so I'll try to just share one. But in uh, the memoir, I really dove into research of my ancestor, um, a Chinook woman, Kamsha Kohalowish. And the more I learned about her, the more strength I, I found in her. And it wasn't like what drew me to her story was this sort of rage and pain for her for reasons that I detail in the book, like her life. But in reading more about her and going over all of the, the history, um, I found out that she was incredibly strong and amazing. And it sort of shifted gears, whereas the first manuscript was just a sad catalog of all of these terrible things, right? And in actually throwing myself into research, I found that not just Kamsha, but so many of the women of my family had these incredible lives and did wild stuff. Um, and so that really carried me through and allowed me to focus just not on, not only on the pain. So um, one of my chapters in the book is called In Memory, and it's about my dad. And I, you know, this is a nice, I'm going to be honest, this is kind of the nice thing about writing when you're an older person, because, because I think we allow ourselves to give others a lot of grace, where I wouldn't have been able to do it in my 20s or my 30s. Um, and so in memory is, is about my dad and, you know, and in one section, I just annihilate him. I am so angry with him. I am so, um, upset with how he made me feel with the abuse, with all of this. And, um, but I do, I do wind it up with... When when he was dying, um, he kept talking. You know, he was on this morphine, right? And he just kept talking. He kept gesturing, and I I felt that he was probably talking to somebody at the height of his career, saving the trumpeter swan. And the gestures were how he was going to do that. So, but I thought it was really interesting, Rick. My husband comes from a military family, and so when Dad died, he wrote for um, the medals, and he wrote for some of the you know information that they would have. My dad had joined World War II when he was 17. He lied about his age. He'd been sent over to the Philippines, which was one of the most brutal grounds. He had um, he'd gone in as a medic which you see the worst of the worst. And he went from just being a, I don't, need, I don't even know, when, when you first come in up to sergeant in 18 months because, you know, people kept dying and he just kept getting punted up. And, um, and the trauma, the trauma he must have experienced during that time because he was a very quiet, artistic person, a boy, a young boy, I, I, you know, heard the stories of when he was a boy. And now I really have to sit there and say, how can we as a society expect somebody to come back from war and be a good husband and be a good father and try to deal with all that? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Since Chris asked the question, I, I want to touch upon it too. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, there's like something. There's like this whole thing where we're only expected to write about our plight, the sad plight of the Native Americans and stuff. But at the same time, I always go back to. I was talking about yesterday, <clears throat> the Little Bighorn battlefield, the headstones honoring my tribe, the Northern Cheyenne. It's a died fighting for the Cheyenne way of life. If you look at the Cheyenne tribe, they just Northern Cheyenne, in particular, not. Um, they just been through so much, um, like some of the most hardcore massacres in U.S. history and stuff, like the Sand Creek massacre and stuff like that. 
there's like been a couple of those and then um yeah and then so i always just like turn you know just knowing all that it gives me like strength it's like not to like lessen my own pain and stuff it's like you have to you have to allow yourself to feel the sadness and stuff but i guess i won't allow myself to feel doomerism about it because it's like you have to keep going you have to be a voice and stuff anyways i don't want to ramble off um <laughs> okay this one's for you chris and um in an interview with one sentence journal fellow montana writer russell roland is russell here oh there he is <laughs> asked you why he didn't specifically talk about being native much and if it was a conscious thing you replied that um you like to think that being native influenced much as of what you wrote anyway so it really didn't need to be said however your upcoming book seems to deal directly with that according to the title becoming little shell and despite you having like this uh infinite native uncle wisdom likely learned the hard way by years of mistakes you know but <laughs> um, you didn't discover your also little shell until a decade ago as is um common um i guess that. so what was it like to coming to terms with all that and also being so involved in the tribe's recent recognition federal recognition writing about all this and yeah what has been yeah your personal approach to all this Well, you know, the Little Shell didn't exist as an entity until 1978 as the Little Shell. So really what we are is we are descendants of the Pembina Band of Chippewa. And I'm happy to see Sterling. Is still Sterling still here? I saw him wander I in. Wandered in. Because he, you know, he's been talking about the Blackfeet a lot and kind of dragging the rest of us Indians beneath the superiority of the Blackfeet. And I would just like to point out that if the Chippewa hadn't moved out onto the high plains a couple thousand years ago and showed the Blackfeet which end of the horse is pointed forward, <laughs> he probably wouldn't even be here. <laughs> so that was for Sterling. As for me, I knew, <laughs> I knew I was Chippewa from the time I was born, you know, from the time I was conscious. So my grandparents would talk, my grandmother would talk about us being Chippewa. But like the whole story of, of my book is the fact that my dad denied his native, and his grandfather, or his father, my grandfather, denied their native heritage at all. And you can even see like in, in the research going through and looking at like old documents, marriage licenses and, and censuses and birth certificates and things like that. My grandmother is listed as either Indian or HB, H, HB for half-breed through her whole life until she marries my grandfather, who's identified himself as white. And from that point forward, now my grandmother's white too. So you see my grandfather's influence on how he's determined they're going to face the world. And I never, so growing up, I've, you know, I've been checking the native box because I wanted that. You know, I, it was clear to me, because my grandmother would talk about it, that we were Chippewa, even though I didn't really know what that meant. But it was an identity that I wanted. You know, I wanted to be Indian. And, you know, when my father passed away in 2014, he was only just beginning to talk a little bit about his life. Any, like, my, my father is like a blank slate until... I'm a child, you know, and I and the only thing I know about him is the experiences I shared with him as his son. Whatever he was before that, I had no idea because he would not talk about it. So my whole trip was in the in my little shell book is you know, when I heard about the Little Shell about that time, maybe 2012, I heard about this Little Shell tribe that was trying to get federal recognition, and I put the pieces together and I thought this has to be who we are because, you know, Lewistown was founded by Métis people who were landless, who became the Little Shell. The Little Shell became an entity as a means to begin the process of getting federal recognition because it was 1978 when the feds finally said, you know, we've got all these Indian tribes that want recognition and we need to create a path forward for that to happen. So it's like we un incorporated under our chief Little Shell in order to 
make possible those of us who were not part of the Rocky Boy Reservation. So it was really a political thing. But but identity and 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 personhood, you know, we were the landless Indians. So I found out, you know, that my when I heard about the little shell tied to Lewistown, I knew that's where my dad was born. I knew he had a grandmother that, you know, I have letters that he wrote to her, you know, when he was 10 years old. So I knew that that's where we had to come from and that we had to have been somehow connected to those first 25 families who founded what is now Lewistown. And these are all Red River Métis from the Red River Valley in Canada and Minnesota and North Dakota. And literally that is who, you know, my family is, you know, my, both the Latres and the Donies and every creative spelling of those two names, which if any of us who does any kind of genealogical research, you've got a bunch of barely literate priests and bureaucrats from Washington, D.C. writing people's names down phonetically, and it's different every time it's written by somebody different. So that creates a challenge also. And I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm realizing I'm way off even remembering what the question was. <laughs> no. but, but, it, but that is it. Th that, that is the difference. So about the time, you know, One Sense Journal is out in the world, I'm already deep into trying to figure out, I already know who I am. But what are the pieces that make me who I am? You know, why do I feel the way I do about certain things? You know, and we want to, I don't think that's exclusive to indigenous people. I think there are a lot of people in the world right now just wandering within themselves to figure out where it is that they came from. But for me, that was it. And, and it, was, it was recognizing who these people in Lewistown were and the fact that my dad should have been so proud to be related to them the way I am, you know? And, 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 you know, you talk about the Northern Cheyenne, you know, we, when our land was taken, you know, migrated out to settlements on the Milk River in Montana and Canada, and we were burned out of there twice by the U.S. Army because they thought we were running guns to the Lakota and the Northern Cheyenne, and I really hope we were. <laughs> I hope we ran a shit ton of guns, and I hope some of those more celebrated monuments and stuff out on the greasy grass are because of guns that my great-great-grandfather put in the hands of, of the Lakota and the Northern Cheyenne. Does that answer your question? Oh, that, that was perfect. So, <laughs> Because you said Northern Cheyenne, so it must be, yeah. yeah. Okay, I actually don't have, have any question, it, but it says background, so this is very important, I guess. Um, so... Uh, so I wanted to talk about your um, Susan and Sasha's backgrounds, ripping off um, Chris. So, um, so what? I mean, particularly Susan. It was like growing up as a. Can you just like describe it? I mean, it's probably better just to read it, but um, just uh, describe what it was just like being the only Native kid in class and stuff. Um, and describe what Billings was like. Where I that was yeah, a generation whatever a couple behind you but um yeah what Billings Montana is like just for people who don't know. Is the only yeah off native kid you said you had a I remember there's a cool story in there about a crow kid you saw but which is but anyway. So we, you know, my dad was was Fish and Wildlife National Fish and Wildlife and so we moved about every three to five years. And you know, it's not like they have fish and wildlife refuges in urban areas. So I know rural Montana really, really well. And, um, and you know, I, I, I was pretty much the only brown kid. Um, I can remember in grade school in Stevensville, um, my best friend who I had like the worst crush on called me a squaw one day. And I knew it wasn't a good word. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it wasn't a good word. So I came home to my mom and I, you know, I said, oh, he's called me a squaw. And she was furious. So she goes into the third grade teacher and, and she says, this is going to stop. This is going to stop now. And the third grade teacher's response was, oh, Susie's doing fine. We have some Mexican kids that don't even go out on the playground anymore. And then, um, and then, you know, um, 
And then when I, I lived in Billings, I lived in Billings from ninth through 12th grade. And, um, and to me, there was a feeling, there was a feeling in Billings that you're not really acceptable. Um, I, I can remember ninth grade, I'm, I'm in my math class, and I mean, I suck at math, so thank God I have some sort of talent. That's all I'm going to say. And um, so I'm sitting in math class, and, you know, everybody's wearing the same, all the girls are wearing the same thing, right? They've got these scoop necks, and they got these mini skirts, and for whatever reason, the teacher decides that he's going to put me in front of him. That was bad. Maybe that was a bad story to tell. <laughs> so, um, so he's going to put me in front of him, and he just kept leering, and it just really made me angry because you know here's all these white girls behind me, and they're not being picked out for anything, you know, because I'm sure the teacher knows that you know their parents would be like the school board immediately. But there was one other Indian kid in class. He was Crow. And man, I liked him. He was so cute and he was dangerous, right? He was as dangerous in this, you know, scary, uh, don't ever ask me out, but we're gonna flirt here a little bit kind of way. And um, and I just remember he was he was everything that my dad hated. You know, um, first thing he says, yeah, my sister, well, she got her per capita, she bought a car and you know, I, and he said, what are you going to do with your per capita? And I said, well, I'm going to go to college. I didn't realize I didn't realize at the time that I could have gone to college for free. So my per capita went to pay for college. And, um, and I said, well, Greg, what are you going to do? He said, nah, I'm going to buy a car. And I just, it was, I just remember just thinking everything that I'd heard about natives, he fit that bill. But he wasn't awful. He wasn't dirty. He wasn't drunk. He wasn't, you know, I could fill in the lines of what he wasn't. And I knew for him and I, that didn't matter. Okay. Now I'll um, do Sasha's version of the question. Um, let's see, how do I phrase this? Um, I guess I'll try to do specifics. Um, I guess... Um, yeah, well, your relations, like, just being in whatever, the punk, gothic type of scene and stuff. I mean, describe your, the areas you, like, grew up in. Then you'd, like, go to the cities and stuff, like, mm -hmm. run away when you're, like, 13 or mm -hmm. something and stuff just to go check out these things. So yeah, um, did you feel, like, isolated? I mean, any isolate or more acceptance or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, um, so... I grew up with my, my mother and my co Salish mother. My bio dad bailed, um, he, my, my white bio dad. So I grew up with my co Salish mom and my stepdad and four brothers and a sister way out on literally our road was called Indian Road. We lived on Indian Road in Swinomish on the res in this single wide trailer on so much land of like forest and like it, rural's not even the right word. We were out there. It would take me like 45 minutes to hitchhike into town. Um, so I felt isolated often. Um, also being, you know, mixed heritage, my often like the, the kids on, and also I don't know if anyone's familiar with Swinomish, but it's, uh, in Northern Washington and right across, we have this little channel that runs through the reservation and directly across the water is this postcard picturesque town called LaConnor, Washington, boats and ice cream shops and all of that shit. And um, it was really intense to, to live, like you could be in the waterfront in La Conner having your fish and chips or whatever and look over and see the reservation where we lived. And I think that it was interesting, like all of the, there was no tribal school, there was no elementary school on the reservation, so we all got funneled into La Conner Elementary and middle school and high school. And so it was sort of this like, violent juxtaposition of a bunch of rich white kids whose parents had boats in the marina and owned all the businesses in town and then the kids you know from the reservation and being mixed heritage 
the white kids were really mean to me because they knew that I was native and lived on the res. And then the native kids would be like, but you're white. And so it was really lonely, um, not feeling accepted really for a long time. And I fell in love with like listening to the alternative college radio station and discovered like the wipers, Nirvana, Bikini Kill, and I would make these mixtapes. And I really found, I think I spoke to this earlier, like I really found like solace and community in these tapes and this music. And so I started going to Seattle all the time and, and seeking that out and finding community there. And then of course growing up, you know, I've returned home and I have a like strong like connection with my family and community, but being a teenager sucks. And like add all of those different factors in, it was incredibly isolating at times. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted like them to tell their stories. I'm Sasha because it's like, oh, well, this is punk rocker and stuff. And then we think, oh, probably lived in Seattle, probably an urban Indian. I was like, no, very isolated, very rural. But um, and then went to seek out, seek this out. But um, yeah, I wanted to um, eat, uh, give you all each um time to read like five to ten minutes just so um, people can get a vibe of your um, whatever. So I guess Susan's prepared, unlike Chris, so <laughs> I had to go get him a book here. <laughs> oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry. I'm just panicking because I didn't know what I was going to read. <laughs> My goodness, I just, I'm, I'm going to give up here. Okay. <laughs> I feel like a rock star now. So, um, so this is book Bitterroot, a Salish memoir of transracial adoption. Um, and it covers the arc of a life. So it's the arc of a life of being adopted. Because how I started out thinking about it is not how I ended up thinking about it. And all of that in between is really important, especially now that the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 is going to be heard by the US Supreme Court as to whether or not it is constitutional because it is based on race. So if anybody wants to talk about that, I'll be available after this session. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is, um, this chapter that I'm reading from is called Institutions of Higher Learning. I went to college here at University of Montana and I got my degree in anthropology. But these are the lessons that I, I learned about what it means to be American Indian in an institution of higher learning. Lesson two, don't expect every professor to be happy you are in, your, in their class. It is spring quarter of 1981, and I'm looking into the ice blue eyes of the cultural anthropology professor, a woman who has extensive experience researching the American Indians of the Great Basin. After she hands back our midterms exams, she asks me to go directly to her office. She has something important to discuss with me. When we leave, she, bird-like, flutters her way out of the classroom and down the hall. I arrive and survey the room as I'm taking a seat. She is already sitting at her desk, her aqua blue shirt illuminating her silver hair, which has been styled in an abrupt blunt cut that sways above her shoulders. Her desk is messy, but my guess is she knows where everything is. She is surrounded by books, standing upright, laying down, leaning against one another, lazy and resigned to being forgotten. As soon as I take my seat, I see her annoyance. Her already thin lips stretch even thinner as she contemplates what she'll say. She crosses her arms in front of her skinny chest and I focus on her words. I realize she's telling me that my work, my average C-level work is inadequate. I have higher expectations of students in my class, she says, releasing one of her chest-hugging arms and pointing a slender finger in my direction, its broadening knuckle revealing her 50-plus years. You're not doing well, and I believe anthropology isn't a discipline you should be even involved in. I don't think it's an interest of yours, and I don't see you applying yourself in any way. What she may or may not know is that those classes, of which I've had several, in which I don't apply myself, are not C classes. 
They are Ds and lower. Find yourself another major, she says, dismissing me from her light blue office. This one isn't working out for you. My blood pulses angrily in my ears and along my wrists. In the seven weeks I've been in her class, we've had no conversations about my interests, my work, or my abilities. I have no idea why the sneak attack just happened now. I'll tell you why, says Carl, a graduate archaeology student who I can usually find in the lab, and today is no different. He is doing paperwork resulting from last summer's field school. When he looks at me, his blue eyes sparkle, but his glaze is serious. She hates Indians. I laugh. What do you mean she hates Indians? That's all she studies. Yeah, he says, returning his attention to the forms in front of him. But her, from her perspective, Indians are great to study. They're just not much good for anything else. Okay, yeah. Um, one of the things about Susan, I think one of the first times I like met her, and I was just like so blown away by her writing, the beauty of it and stuff, but I knew she was like this hardcore academic, and I think it just slipped out. It's like, you write really good for an academic. Wait, did I just say? It, and it was surprised, unsurprised. I don't know. She said, well, yeah, I've heard that before. So I was like, oh, okay. I didn't feel so bad after that. Okay. <clears throat> So um, I've been reading a lot from Red Paint for the book tour and stuff, and I kind of had these, like, what I was calling my, my mixtape or my greatest hits. Like, I would just, like, be like, that's the set list. But I'm going to deviate from that and read um, an entirely different, a whole different vibe. Um, it's towards the end of the book. Um, I'm, I guess all you need to know is I'm on my ex-husband's punk tour um, across Europe. And I had just, um, I hadn't realized I was uh, suffering PTSD. We didn't really know what was going on. So I think that's all you need to know. This is like a fun chapter because I'm on tour. This is as fun as it gets for me, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> Leaving my body wasn't unknown to me. I had learned to disassociate when I was 10 as a defense tactic. It wasn't an ability I was consciously aware of. It would just sort of happen. A fog would cloud my brain, and I'd slip down into myself, someplace safe. It was as involuntary as breathing. It was reflex. But when the strange phenomenon came back into my life as an adult, I wasn't prepared. It had been a little over a year since the Australian tour. Brandon and I had been trying to move past it. But I grew colder as the months went by. I sank deep down into myself. I drove up north more frequently. I rekindled a deep relationship with my 14-year-old self convinced that if I could tap into the past, I could save myself from drowning in memory in the present. I retraced her steps, returning again and again to that trailer. Things got worse. Brandon tried to reassure me. I'm here, he kept telling me. You've got to move past this. The first time I fainted, I was walking across the parking lot outside of a market in Dublin. I collapsed onto the... Oh. This is me on the fly. It's bad. I collapsed onto the concrete and Brandon rushed to me, bringing me, my, bringing me to my feet and offering me my inhaler. I took two puffs. My body quaked with tremors, like the medication somehow aggravated my condition rather than helped my breath return. Back in the hotel that night, I curled my body along the window as Brandon slept. I looked down at the city below, still bustling with drunken noises of nightlife. We decided the attack was a result of my asthma, that perhaps the travel had been a trigger. I looked at my plastic inhaler, then back out to the lively streets of Dublin, unconvinced the small plastic rescue inhaler would truly save me. After two weeks in Ireland, we joined his band in Italy. The fainting continued as we traveled in the van across Europe. I kept it to myself when I could. I shrank down into the back of the van. I tried to make myself invisible. I tried to make myself useful. I sold merch, loaded gear, and fought against anxiety. I took care of the asthma attacks when I could. In Slovenia, after helping unload the van and while the band set up in the venue, I grabbed my bag and took off into the lamplit village. Brandon worried about me going alone, but I assured him I would be fine. I wanted a bed and a bath and an evening to myself. I needed a break from smoke-filled venues, rowdy crowds, and loud guitars. That night, I walked the cobblestoned pathways along the river. 
Great stone statues of dragons and gargoyles looked over me as I made my way through the narrow roads. The village made me think of Dracula, specifically Gary Oldman in Bram Stoker's Dracula. I thought about sex and candles. I missed romance. I missed intimacy. I ate a salad and a slice of pizza by the water. I drank a glass of red wine. On my way to the inn, I stumbled upon a beautiful marble fountain in the middle of a dark square. Illuminated by a single street lamp, the fountain looked dark and ominous. I climbed the steps and sat on the ledge. Figures of sea maidens and merfolk glowed against the shadows. Sitting at the fountain, I let the fear of whatever was happening to me, breathlessness, blackouts, loss of consciousness, find me. I sat by the fountain in the moonlit plaza and wept, alone and so far from home. Along with the fear, a certainty crept in. I was not where I needed to be, but wherever I was supposed to be was unknown. The tour went on, fainting came in and out. I was jugg juggling graduate work and selling the band's merch in loud DIY punk bars. In Prague, I sat posted at the bar for hours, wrapping up an essay before a midnight deadline. Then I drank a glass of absinthe and walked to the Charles Bridge. In England, I lost my spot in the van. The guys had invited a friend from Greece to join on the last leg of the tour, and the week he was to join them, the van they were driving broke down. They got a new van, but it had one seat fewer. The plan was that I would do some traveling on my own, spend time in Berlin and Hamburg, before meeting back up with the band in London. I wasn't afraid of traveling alone, but I was afraid of losing my breath. I was afraid of fainting on my own. Still, I ventured into train stations and unknown cities independently. I eventually made it to King's Cross Station in downtown London, the rendezvous spot, and waited, and waited. The van never came. Finally, I got a message from Brandon explaining the guys wanted to stop in Camden Town to visit a famous record shop. He had no control over this, he explained. I had ridden a train and a bus from Bristol to make it to this meeting place. I was sick and I was terrified of fainting. A relentless cough had settled into my chest and each day the rumbling wheeze in my lungs became worse. I just sighed and offered to wait it out. But when he said they were stuck in bad traffic, I knew they weren't going to pick me up. He sent me a pin of the warehouse they were playing in. I'd have to meet them at the venue. I'm gonna stop there even though that's not a fun spot. <laughs> Adrian threw this at me, but I'm not going to read from it. I have a, there's, there's this company called Wild Sam that puts out these little tw travel guides. They're like little small digest things. And they just published one a couple weeks ago for Western Montana. And a few months prior to that, the editor, who's a Missoula guy, formerly a Missoula guy, asked if I had anything to provide for like the cultural essay type thing, which I was happy to, and so that's what I'm going to read. And I think I can bring it in in under 10 minutes. It's called Cart Trails. Before I drink my coffee, I must answer to the insistent trills of the red-winged blackbirds awakening the season with their noisy return. So I am out to fill my bird feeders. The cold feels like winter when I step out onto my front porch, and I must move carefully because of the thin layer of ice that is formed on the boards overnight. This early spring morning, the pale light just before full dawn is so sharp it almost hurts. I gaze west across a few wide fields and linger. From here, I can see the remains of the paper mill where my late father worked for more than 40 years. I say remains because ever since it shut down more than a decade ago, it's been steadily stripped for scrap. Now all that is left from its previous, previous sprawl are a few crumbling shapes that resemble skeleton-like hulks of stone and rebar. The birds aren't the only noisy ones outside. A few miles northeast, a jet prepares to take off from the Missoula airport, while similarly distant on Interstate 90, which runs east-west through the valley, the rumble of cars and trucks is a constant. It is this cacophony combined with the faded industry of the mill and the airport with its business travelers and bustle that reminds me how this place has always been a landscape for commerce. How the Mullen Road, the route just up from my driveway that takes me by the old mill, is the namesake of the original Mullen Road, a rough passage started in 1859 for the military, but quickly turned over to vehicles of trade. 
Today's road approximates the route carved out from before Montana was its own defined U.S. territory. Even before then, the road was largely a cart trail made by the devilishly, infamously squeaky wheels of the carts of the, my indigenous ancestors, the Red River Métis. Those wooden wheels rolled all over Montana from their origin in the Red River Valley of what is now Canada, hunting and trading, making a sound perhaps best described by the writer Joseph Kinsey Howard as if a thousand fingernails were drawn across a thousand planes of glass. So many of the roads we take for granted today are built along tracks first made by Red River carts. Starting in the early 1800s, we Métis migrated back and forth from our homes in Canada, Minnesota, and North Dakota, chasing buffalo. In those days, we were the Pembina Band of Chippewa, named after the high cranberry that we combined with buffalo meat and fat to make pemmican, for a time the most valuable trade item in the region. We traveled in cart trains numbering as few as a few score to over a thousand. Think of entire villages on wheels, men, women, children, and cattle. Everyone pitching in to transform the hides and meat of the buffalo into not just an economy, but an entire culture. It didn't last. American commitment to manifest destiny left the Métis homeless when our land in North Dakota was stolen out from under us. When the United States decided not to recognize Métis as a unique indigenous people as Canada did, we were essentially erased from U.S. history. Those of us stranded in Montana scrabbling to survive became known as the landless Indians. We were that for 156 years until we finally gained federal recognition as the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians in December of 2019. Montana has 12 tribes with federal recognition today, spread over seven reservations. In a technical sense, the Little Shell Chippewa, as the 574th tribe recognized by the United States, are the newest of them. Our history entwines with Montana for as long as that name has existed and before, and we have relatives married into every reservation in the state. In an important sense, my people traced many paths that would define and bind together this far-flung state. No one knew the country like us. Many of us were happy to show others the way around from places like, for example, Fort Hall, a Hudson's Bay Company outpost all the way down near Pocatello, Idaho, just off the Oregon Trail. It was from there that a young Métis guide named Gabriel Prudhomme and several of his kinfolk delivered Father Pierre-Jean de Smit and two others priests north to what is now Stevensville, Montana, not far south of where I live, to establish St. Mary's Mission in 1841. There is a historical site there, a mission, not the original one, and a cemetery, even a replica of a Red River cart, though there is no mention of Prudhomme or the Métis at all. Then there is John Mullen, who as a lieutenant in the United States Army, led the building of the road that would bear his name. He and the men he commanded achieved this feat, a road connecting Montana's Fort Benton, the highest point steamboats could reach on the Missouri River, with Fort Walla Walla in Washington in an unimaginable two years through some fiendishly difficult terrain, including my present-day neighborhood. John Mullen was no stranger to the region and its challenges. Isaac Stevens, a military hard-ass appointed by President Franklin Pierce in 1853 to be the governor of the new Washington Territory, which included today's Montana, headed west shortly thereafter with Mullen under his command. Along the way, Stevens was tasked to survey a railroad route to the Pacific coast. He also negotiated with Indian tribes between here and there. Most infamously in my neighborhood, Stevens orchestrated the Hellgate Treaty of 1855 with the Bitterroot Salish, Upper Ponderé, and Lower Kootenai tribes. This treaty, which achieved the United States theft of the Bitterroot Valley from the Salish while reneging on every single one of its promises to the Indians, was argued over and signed at a location along the Clark Fork River west of Missoula called Council Grove, now a state park. If not for fences between me and there, I could walk overland and arrive inside, inside of an hour. Instead, I drive there almost every day using Mullen Road. Mullen didn't spend a lot of time with Stevens. Instead, he explored the area to find a route for the railroad. He traveled vast swaths of territory, logging thousands of rugged miles. One of his most important guides in this task was a Métis man named Gabriel Prudhomme the same guide who had delivered the Catholics to the Bitterroot a dozen years earlier.
I grew up in the area and never heard of Gabriel Prudhomme or of Jocko Finley, for that matter, another Métis guide, this time in the employ of the legendary British-Canadian adventurer David Thompson, whose name is attached to the landscape up and down the Flathead, Re Flathead Reservation to my north. I never knew either that my hometown, Frenchtown, just down the road from where I live now, was a Red River Métis resettlement place beginning in the late 1850s, about the time Mullen was building his road through there. Or that Plains, Montana, where my grandparents are buried, is another. I grew up never hearing the word Métis, not until I started looking and listening in the wake of my father's death in 2014. It was then that I decided I needed to know more about who we are, where we came from, because he was notably closed-lipped about it. Like my grandfather and so many other Métis of his generations, my dad denied any Native heritage or any relation to anyone else in the state sharing our name. Since I started researching our story, I find us everywhere in every part of the state. I am often given pause in this new connection I discovered with this place where I grew up. Not just how the desk and chair and computer in my room facing the western horizon are the engine of my personal economy, the same way noisy carts and wanderlust were to my ancestors. Or how my footloose nature drives me to duck my head and explore those faint paths veering away from the more beaten ones, literally and figuratively. Like my ancestors, I often struggle to find a means to support a livelihood in this beautiful landscape. And like them, I am still here. Okay. Um, yeah, that um, actually, oh, you're talking about research. I looked at said something that my notes just said research. So um, because I wanted to um, <laughs> ask about the some since it is a nonfiction panel, and I'm bringing, um, Chris talking about doing his own research and stuff there, um, and uh, it kind of draws back to um, Erdrich the other night said, um, "Yeah, people don't realize how much um, native or we have to research and stuff. How much we pour into like looking back at our past just to make sure everything's all ship shape and correct. It's not like we just all of a sudden have go to the mountaintop and we know all this." magical history just like that you know i mean i do but um other people don't but um <laughs> um so uh speaking of, so we're just gonna uh make sure we get that discussed so um susan what was it like uh you like actually took classes and stuff to i mean a very academic sense like literally start taking those classes and stuff so the non fic anyway you you can tell the story better than i can so <laughs> So, um, as I said, I got my master's in cultural anthropology um, in the in 2000, 2006. And when I, when I did that research at the time, there wasn't really anything written on American Indian transracial adoption. And there still isn't much of anything written on American Indian transracial adoption um, that deals with theory. And um, so what Bitterroot contains is it has theoretical backgrounds about why some of the stuff that happened to me and other adoptees happen. So it's theory like racial um, and ethnic group belonging, that there's rules in every single ethnic group about who belongs and who doesn't and the characteristics they must have and if they don't have their characteristics, how they're defined as other. Another theory is um, social hierarchy and capital acquisition. So social hierarchy, every society has a social hierarchy and it's, it's very powerful people at the top. And I'm gonna be honest, in the United States of America, that group of very powerful pe people is old white moneyed men. And, um, and I'm, I, so, and then they have the ability to place anybody in that social hierarchy below them. Nobody's going to be equal with them, and there's probably not even going to be a few people within the first two floors below them. Um, so, so they they place these, you know, they place these groups wherever they feel they should be based on. 
a variety of characteristics. How much like them, how much like are they like us? So as you can guess, American Indians are somewhere at the bottom. Um, as a consequence, one of the things that they also bring in is what what types of what types of capital do you have that's going to determine where you are? So, like social capital would be who are you related to? Um, do you know the people you're related to? Do you know your kinship? Do you know um, do do you have people that can I kind of help you up the ladder? But then on the other hand, there's also people that can are gatekeepers that that keep you where you are. Um, cultural capital. Do you know your language? Do you know your your stories? Do you know um, you know? Do you know your history? Um, do you know the songs? Do you know the dances? Well, with American Indian transracial adoptees, we are higher up in the social hierarchy. If you look at the um, at the non-native social hierarchy. In the social hierarchy, we are in the basement. We don't know any of that stuff. And it's going to be really difficult for us to learn any of that stuff because now you've got the gatekeepers involved. Um, the last one is social memory. So how do we know these things? And all you have to do is look around, read, read the highway signs. There was one highway sign that Rick found over in um, Utah that was about the um, the stage or the Pony Express, and it had talked about when it was started and how it didn't last very long because it just um, it was being attacked by um, a plague of Indians, a plague of it. Now this is the United States of America. This is like a BLM sign. So, you know, when you listen to people's language, when you, when you see what is being said in front of our faces, you have an idea of where people are getting the idea of how to view people like us. And so I've interspersed those into here so that people can understand um, what our world is like and, and how, we view, how we view it from our eyes. Okay, thank you. And um, okay, S Sasha, uh, I thought there was something that read in an interview by you. It's like you had to do a lot of research of yourself about your own tribe and own family and stuff. But it's like one of the things, I don't know, I mean, you can talk about whatever, but just a quote that stuck out just because it resonated with me so much is sometimes you go down these uh, research holes, like rabbit holes, and next thing you know, you're just like, reading off about Lewis and Clark for like a whole day and it's like, oh crap, I wasn't even supposed to, you know, so anyway, that's how history works, so, but anyways. Yeah, and more often than not, it's a total bummer. Um, I, um, I knew that, I mean, no, I didn't know right away that I was gonna be heavy, heavy into research. I was just like, I wanna write about my feelings. Um, but <laughs> I did, I was silly. Um, but the more, you know, I, I only knew so much about um, my ancestor, this woman called Kamsha, um, from the stories I heard from my, from my mother, my grandmother, my great grandma, great, great grandmother. And, but the more I fell into the story of red paint and what was sort of guiding me, like I literally like anchored myself to these women um, and their stories and, the what was passed down to me through like like oral like tellings like only took me so far and so i ended up having to go down to el waco this tiny fishing village that kamsha lived in after the smallpox epidemic wiped out her village um and i went there several times and it was super funny the first time i went i went into the town's tiny little library and I will never forget the look on the librarian's face when I walked in with like my like Joy Division shirt, my tattoos, and she was just like, this lady's lost. And I was like, no, I'm actually gonna post up here for like seven hours and read all of your like historical society section. Um, but I did so much research and uh, like Adrian mentioned, um, there would be days where I, the more I would learn about her and this um, Scottish sea captain she married, the more I would fall into these rabbit holes where I'm like, oh, they, they mentioned the sea captain here. 
And then fast forward like two hours later where I am reading about Lewis and Clark or some other bummer. And, um, but it really did enrich like the story, like these details, even when they were harsh or hard to get through, it helped me understand more about her and like checking my family's like timeline of things. Like my mother had all of these, I feel like I'm just gonna ramble about this. I'm gonna try to focus. Um, you know, I had this big like folder that my mom had given me of like letters and newspaper clippings and uh, like family lineage stuff and dates. And then when I would go like cross reference and see the timelines of like El Waco and different newspaper and things, like it really um, helped balance things and like I understood more about her life. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Did I answer the question? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I understand it. I mean, but yeah, I'll read, I mean, as a nonfiction writer myself, it's, it's like I'll read like 10,000 words just to write one paragraph and then next, and then just like ingesting all this information. Just to, Okay, I guess uh, Chris now. Sure. So I, I do a lot of presentations like for Humanities Montana around the state talking about the Métis and the Little Shell and all of these things. And I always make a point to tell them I am not a historian. I don't have an academic bone in my body. I have a high school diploma is the limit of my education. So all of the, I wear with pride that none of the qualifications that should give me the right to talk about what I talk about, I have none of them. Because when you think about all of the things that Susan mentioned that to, to define a culture, you know, or, or, or a people, their, their culture, their language, the same shitheads in charge of universities are the ones who were part of the program to beat all that stuff out of us in the first place. So when you think about language and the fact like our last first language Ojibwe speaker in Montana died of COVID two years ago, you know? So the language is strong in other parts of the country, but not in Montana. Uh, a, a friend of mine who, who is a first language speaker in up north says there's like a dozen elders, first language speaker, Salish speakers left on the reservation there. And then it's her, and she's like 30 and her four kids. And that's it for language. And she also happens to be a cultural teacher. So all of these things that, that are that supposed to define in the white man's eyes who we are are things that the white man made every effort to eliminate, not just like eradicate from the world. So, you know, if I want to know about the Métis that lived in the Teton Canyon, I'm not going to go to the history books. I'm going to go to Al Wiseman, who lives in Shoto, whose, whose parents were part of that community. You know, I'm going to go... If I want to hear more about who our namesake, Little Shell, Ayabwebi Tongue was his actual name, means he who rests on the way. If I want to know more about him, I'm going to go to Belcourt, North Dakota, which is the, the tribal capital of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, which is where we come from. So I like to tell people that Louise Erdrich is like my cousin because we're, we're both from the same people. And, and whatever I learn from that elder there is the person that I'm going to cite if somebody ever says, well, prove what you're telling me. Al told me that's good enough for me and it should be good enough for you. You know, um, my, I've learned a lot from family documents about my great, great grandfather, Mose Latre, who was one of the original Lewistown founders. And if I could find somebody who told me he taught the Blackfeet had to hunt buffalo using a lightning bolt riding a unicorn. That would be in my frickin' book. <laughs> and I would not allow anybody to challenge the truth of that. Because if I can find an elder to tell me, that's what I'm going to use. Because that's how we always did it. That's why I literally, if you want to literally believe a guy died on a cross for your sins, I'm going to literally believe <laughs> we are floating on the back of a turtle right now. Because that's what I want to believe. So that's, I guess that's my research. All righty. Um, yeah, that's a great way to end this. Um, we have a poetry panel coming up, and um, Chris will be um, hosting that. Um, I don't know when you want to do that. Give people 15, 10 minutes, whatever. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I'd love to give everyone another round of applause for... Um, yeah. <laughs> Are you
Are you guys ready? Because we're ready. I know poets get a perception that we're like dull and inward thinking and all that, but we're going to tear the roof off this freaking place. I'm not really even going to bother with introductions because some people need no introduction. We have Vic Charlo, our elder here. Yes. The poet laureate of these traditional Salish lands, Vic Charlo. We have Mandy Smoker, previous poet laureate. Recently wrote a graphic novel about indigenous, yes. And Heather Cahoon, who almost, almost a year ago to the day in this very room infused this library with enough indigenous lang or energy that it was recently voted the best library in the world. That's Heather Cahoon. You know, when we were talking about this festival, Sterling said, you know, we're not going to bring any, nobody wants to listen to poets. And I kind of had to hold Heather back from like just beating him senseless through a Zoom meeting. <laughs> so, you know, at some point we're going to have each of you read. Do we want to start with that or do we want to talk a little bit first? Or uh, presumably you're prepared to read something. You want to open with a reading? Let's do that. Vic, would you be willing to read for us? Me? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll pass this thing from my face to yours. All right. There's these, these poems I wrote a long time ago. And this one is called Flathead River Creation. You say old days fold into one another and new days seem the same. At each moment shifts with sun, nothing will be the same as this. When wind breathes the flathead alive, you are the center this instant for all. You are the creation of the universe one more time. And another one I wrote during that time is called Dixon Direction. Directions are simple here. Geese know where to go and eagles fly. Yet sometimes you get lost on wrong roads. Then when you come to school, you seek from this high window and find living river, red willow, white aspen, Old juniper and pine, this is you, and bright clay cliffs fix the stars. Mm. How about that for now? <laughs> well, I wanted to start off um, with my favorite poem by Jim Welch. Um, the reason we're all here. Not, and not just literally today, but <laughs> the reason why I'm here as a poet. Um, the, if you haven't read Writing the Earth Boy 40, um, his only collection, it's, there we go. <laughs> um, I consider it to be my, my Bible. Are you going to do this too? No, oh. Just <laughs> it's very Are you just jumping on my idea over here, Heather? No, just kidding. Um, but uh, this poem is called um, Harlem, Montana. I know I got some people from Fort Belknap around here. Uh, just off the reservation. We need no runners here. Booze is law and all the Indians drink in the best tavern. Money is free if you're poor enough. Disgusted, busted whites are running for office in this town wise enough to qualify for laughter. The constable, a local farmer, plants the jail with wild, raven-haired stiffs who beg 
for just one more drink. One drunk, a former Methodist, becomes a saint in the Indian church, bugs the plaster man on the cross with snakes. If his knuckles broke, he'd see those women wail the graves goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye, Harlem on the rocks. So bigoted, you forget the latest joke. So lonely, you'd welcome a battalion of Turks to rule your women. What you don't know, what you will never know or want to learn, Turks aren't white. Turks are olive, unwelcome, alive in any town. Turks would use your one dingy park to declare a need for loot. Turks say, bring it, step quickly, lay down and dead. Here we are when men were nice. This photo, hung in the New England hotel lobby, shows them nicer than pie, agreeable to the warring bands of redskins who demanded protection money for the price of food. Now only Hutterites out north are nice. We hate them. They are tough and their crops are always good. We accuse them of idiocy and believe their belief all wrong. Harlem, your hotel is overnamed. Your children are raggedy assed, but you go on, survive. told her she should also read one of hers. Um, so I'm just going to read the title poem to Horsefly Dress. A long wing feather propels the stunted body of a black crowned night heron through air, breaking apart the dried mouth of memory. In an outpouring of primordial story, I hear her name, Chattanooga. The hunting moon, an Earth's coyote's eldest and only daughter, her name no longer spoken, she turned to porous stone. But I hear her name, Chattanooga, along Flathead River near Rive, in the cutting of meat, its crackled drying above smoldering cottonwood. Chattanooga, at the edge of river, in passing water, the embodiment of belief, she perforates the divide between known and unknown. Here, she reconsiders the archeology span of our suffering. Her mouth opens in the alarm cry of a brown thrasher, a warning, brace for all that's wrapped into a name. So who last night was here or at the Wilma for, we all read last night together with some other people. They weren't poets though, so they're not really as important. <laughs> One Vic of the moments of a couple that you were a part of that I enjoyed the most was when you talked about this book. Would you recreate what you said about it last night? Because what I loved about it is, as writers, you know, we are often supposed to, like, ah, shucks, downplay any success we have. And, you know, as poets, it's, it's hard to get people to pay attention to us. And that's their fault, not ours. And, and Vic was clearly able to pro project into a thousand-seat room his joy over being included in this anthology. And I, I would like you to talk about that again, if you would. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, Frog Creek Circle came First of all, it came in this, from this book, Puche, which means good enough in Salish, Puche. And, and there's, a, there's a poem about that in the back. And what I liked about, it, about Joe, well, first of all, Joe Harjo 
is the first Native American poet laureate in the United States. The first one ever. And the incredible thing is, is I got in her book. <laughs> wow. Well, I didn't even know my book was even in the running. Uh, just one day, I went to the post office and, oh, what's, in, what's there? And I got this and I said, hmm, boy, that's pretty nice. And I didn't think I was in it. <laughs> I just thought they, they gave me this really nice book. And so... And all of a sudden, I thought, hey, maybe I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went thumb through it. And boy, here I was. I was in it. Pretty incredible. And so there it is. When the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. Our sang songs came through. And I have songs. And, well, I, have a, I will do a song today. And this is, what, this is what I was thinking about when, when all this went on. Okay? Okay. And I'll read the poem. It's called Frog Quick Circle. It's for my family, especially Jan. And Jan is my former wife, and but she's still a pal. Mountains so close, we are relative. Quick so cold, it brings winter rain. We return to warm August home, frog quick, where I've lived so long that smells are stored only, are stored open only here. This land never changes, always whole. Always the way we want it to be. We always come back to check our senses or to remember dreams. We are remembered today in a circle of family of red pine, of old time chiefs, of forgotten horses that thunder dark stars. These are songs that come to this day, soft as Indian mint, strange as the sky. This, and this, this poem, will be at the university. They're doing a, a building for Native American stuff. And I got to see that back in the 60s. And now they've got a place for it. And so they're going to have that. And this poem will be in stained glass at the entrance of this, of this building which is pretty amazing. Okay, now I'm going to drop the first bomb on you people. And today's is the announcement that actually all three of them are in this book. Would you folks be willing to read yours also? I, I have them dog-eared here if you need it. And it's, it's your Jim Welch one, and it's on page one, whoops, 160, I think. Okay. Yes, 160. This is what being a prepared moderator is all about. <laughs> Who here is a page dog earer? Who thinks that's a crime against literature? <laughs> Russell? Yeah, okay. You guys can leave whenever you want. is squirrely. Okay, yeah. there. Um, I, I read this poem last night or yesterday evening. Um, it, uh, when I came here to the MFA program, um, Jim was still alive and I only got to meet him a couple of times, but he has just been a, a, a force and a presence um, in my, my life and my, my writing. And um, so I was sort of moving back between Missoula and Fort Peck and, you know, driving through um, terrain and landscape that I know he had inhabited and also moved around in. And I just, I knew he was sick and I felt like there were a lot of things I wanted to know. <laughs> and I didn't know if I would, 
get to ask him, so I wrote this poem instead. Cross Current for James Welch. The first harvest of wheat in flatlands along the milk startled me into thoughts of you and this place we both remember and also forget as home. Maybe it was the familiarity, or maybe it was my own need to ask if you have ever regretted leaving. What bends? What gives? And have you ever missed this wind? It has now grown warm with late summer, but soon it will be as dangerous as the bobcat stalking calves and pets just south of the river. Men take out their dogs and a case of beer and wait in their pickups for dawn for a chance with their rifles. They don't understand that she isn't going to make any mistakes. With winter, my need for an answer grows more desperate and there are only four roads out. One is the same cat hunter's drive with mannish glory and return along, gun still, oil shined, and unshot. Another goes deeper into Assiniboine territory. This is the one I should talk myself into taking next. I haven't much traveled the third, except to visit a hospital where, after the first time, my mother had refused chemotherapy. And the last road you know as well as I do past the coral-painted Catholic church, its doors long ago sealed shut to the mouth of Mission Canyon, then south just a ways to where the Rockies cut open and forgive. There, you and I are on the ascent. After that, the arrival is what matters most. One sixty two. I am the table of contents. <laughs> I wrote this poem when I, I think I was eighteen years old. So it's a very, very old. Um, it's called Blonde. It is November and the sun has gone south almost as far as it can. Cold air flies wildly through the sky, the bare and frantic reaches of trees and through the dying grasses on Camas Prairie. This wind knows me by the color of my hair, a light in darkness. It is November and I can see my soul slowly leaving my body every time I exhale. Dad and I take the shortcut across Camas Prairie to Dog Lake. He is telling me stories of children with black hair and brown eyes. My reflection in the side mirror tells me what I already know. He talks of these children until I am left standing in the icy wind watching as he drives away. It is November and the dying grasses on the prairie are the same color as my hair. If I wanted, I could lie down in them and disappear. I could escape the angry wind, but I don't. I know the land and I would blend together into one, and then no one would ever know I had existed. So I stand. So, oh, thanks. I, my, so that, that came out in a chat book so, so, so long ago, and my dad... Um, he, I gave him a copy, and he, he just like went somewhere in, in our house, and he read the whole thing, and then he came out. The first thing, the only thing he said to me was, I never left you on Cabas Prairie. <laughs> I said, Dad, it's a metaphor. He said, what's a metaphor? <laughs> I said, don't worry about it. Nobody's ever going to think you left me on Cabas Prairie. And then sure enough, we, uh, people at the, the People Center uh, had a book signing for me, and some of the first people came in, they all said, oh my God, what an asshole, your dad left you on <laughs> Camas Prairie. <laughs> so I was never left on Camas Prairie. <laughs> I 
I just want to say she knows how much I absolutely love that poem. I teach it to middle school and high school students all the time, and they simply adore it and connect to it and attach with it in so many different ways. So if any of you are teachers or work with young people out there, that's a great one. And I would also say that all three of us, there was a book created by the Montana Office of Public Instruction. It's called Birthright. Birthright and it has all, meant several of our, each of our poems in it with teaching tips as well. So that's out there. Aren't all of you, all three of you also in the Living Nations, Living Words? Is that the title of it? The other Harjo anthology? I think all three of you are in that one too. This is like a rock star <laughs> assembly here. So, you know, Mandy, her term as co-poet laureate ended like a year ago. And while she and Melissa Kwasney were poet laureate of Montana, I called Mark Gibbons my personal poet, poet laureate. So then when they their term ended, suddenly Mark Gibbons became Poet Laureate, was voted to be Poet Laureate. So I'm going to proclaim now that Heather Cahoon is my personal Poet Laureate <laughs> oh, to summon the power from the universe to make her the next Poet Laureate. And we talked about Joy Harjo being the first, and I think she served like three consecutive terms, right? And she's in September being replaced by Ada Lamone, who is an absolutely magnificent poet if you've not read her. And I feel like, and I called Vic the poet laureate of the traditional Salish lands, which we are on here. And we talk about poet laureates, and then I feel like there's a lot of people who kind of like, like, what's a poet laureate? So I thought I would ask Mandy, <laughs> since you have intimate personal relationship with having been, a, what, what does it mean? And what, what did you do as poet laureate of Montana? I mean, what were your expectations? And how was it different, like when you didn't get a check? What else was different from what you expected the, the reward say, to don't, be? You don't, you don't get paid. Right. So there's, <laughs> um, it's, you know, in our state statute, it's legislation that was passed. It's appointed by the governor uh, through the Arts Montana Arts Council. They um, receive nominations um, from different people around the state. Uh, Melissa and I were nominated by a former, former Poet Laureate from Billings, Tammy Holland. Um, very, very grateful for that. We have other Poet Laureates in the room as well. Um, I think there have been seven of us. Cheryl, is that right? Maybe, somewhere around there. <laughs> um, we did have one other um, Native Poet, um, Henry Rilbird was our first Native Poet, so that's really cool. Um, but what do we do? Well, <laughs> in theory, you know, you travel around Montana and really serve as an ambassador for poetry. You know, you go to communities like Missoula and Bozeman where there might be a broader audience, but you also go out to smaller communities like White Sulphur Springs or Shelby or Sydney, you know. You just sort of show up and hope other people show up <laughs> um, to, you know, sort of hear and engage. Um, you know, Melissa and I made, you know, an effort to really reach out to Native communities in particular. Um, unfortunately, the majority of our tenure was during the pandemic. So we had to do a number of events online, um, but those were great, actually. There were some really, really fun experiences that we had. Um, but, you know, as, you know, two women from, um, you know, communities, then, you know, going to remote places where people don't always engage with folks like us um, was really important to us that we, we get out there and that we do it together and that we sort of share our stories and our experiences, you know, through our poems and just hopefully help Montana um, under, you know, really value its fine literary tradition. And then also to see that even though we might look different or come from different communities or, you know, have different lives that, you know, poetry can really be something that, that connects us. Um, as people, as a common thread. Um, and I'm just so grateful to Melissa Kwasney. I think she's one of um, Montana's finest writers. So if you haven't read her stuff, I got to give her, her that due and that plug. Thanks. Heather, this question is, I'm going to direct to you. Um, so I work with kids a fair amount and, you know, or, or when I get asked to speak, whether it's teaching or, or just 
bloviating to them about whatever, you know, to fill time. One point I like to make is that you, you know, there's, and we talked about it in the panel this morning, the, the memoir panel, as far as, you know, kind of the expectations, like, like writing about our trauma or any of the, like, kind of this almost stereotypical things that non-Indian readers expect to get when they read Indian writers. And I like to tell whether they're artists or writers or whatever, if you're an Indian, you're making Indian art. You know, so, so like if I wrote a poem wishing Missoula had a Waffle House in it, it's an Indian wishing Missoula had a Waffle House. It doesn't have anything to do with feathers. You know, I could read it with a drum beat to make it a little more Indian. I wish Missoula had a Waffle House. But when Mandy was reading her poem and she's talking about Assiniboine, you know, my great, great grandmother was Assiniboine. And... And when I hear all of your work, I hear references to these things. And, and that is what Native kids probably don't hear enough of. So there's definitely this balance between writing traditionally and, and writing just whatever you feel like. And, and your book, Heather, is such a, a story that mixes contemporary with with like traditional spiritual stories and all of those things. And I'm just wondering, do you ever give any kind of consideration to that as to like who your audience is versus just what you want to write about or is what you want to write about tend to be more traditional? Cause I wrestle with that with my own work. Um, I think some of the, some of the poems are, I have an audience in mind, and it's usually young people from home. Um, but then it's all people, because I think there is so much that unites people. And um, one of my favorite emotions is that of awe, and I think that's such a powerful emotion. And um, yeah, so I think that uh, in horsefly dress, especially, you know, I wrote it. I think it took four years to write all the poems in this book, and because you need that common theme. You know, I wrote poems that didn't make it into this, so I do write poems outside mm -hmm. of, you know, but the theme of this was how in searching for stories and information about Chattanooks, I ended up uh, listening to and reading more of our oral traditions than I ever had been exposed to in my whole life prior to that. And all of a sudden, I was just overwhelmed with the significance of the information contained in there about how to progress through your life as a human being. And it was astounding, and especially in terms of suffering, the role of suffering and the beauty around suffering and rebirth and all of these themes that um, I just, until I studied them, you know, just looking for stories about horsefly dress because I wanted to know more about her. Um, yeah, so that that was sort of just the theme of this, but that is like an interest in something I write about. And um, the manuscript that I'm working on right now is called Nala Skylihu, which is people eating monster. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's not the season for talking about coyote stories, but um, in them, coyote engages um, the monsters that are devouring humans and sometimes they have a physical form and he kills them. Sometimes they kill him and he is reborn and um, sometimes the monsters are like famine, um, freezing cold weather, you know, all of these different things. And so he teaches the humans how to survive through those by disarming the threat that is posed. So today that just is so easy to translate into addiction, self-doubt, all of these other things that threaten to devour us, to kill us. And um, I just think that there's such brilliance and such um, just critical information in those stories that I wanna uplift that and sort of disentangle it from, I mean, a lot of the stories I read were uh, recorded by like ethno, you know, historians, right. and anthropologists, and um, a lot, though, our culture committee has worked to record directly from elders. Um, we still have storytelling events, so I, I was able to listen to some, but um, all of that stuff, I think, is so important. I want to pull that into my next book as mm -hmm. well, just because it's a just like a personal 
um, interest of yeah. mine that I think is so valuable to anybody. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Vic, I'd like to ask you about, like for those of us, you know, we're here at the James Welch Native Lit Festival and, you know, recognizing Jim as one of those kind of trailblazers that allows the rest of us now to be able to do what we do. And I would say you are absolutely part of that legacy also. You know, we're celebrating Jim, but there was a number of people at the same time. And when I was talking to Lois a couple of weeks ago, you know, at the time that Jim was going to the University of Montana, there were only four Indians. And she was trying to, we, we thought you were one of the four going to school here at that time. And it was a different world. It was a different time to be a poet. And, and I'm, I would just like to hear you maybe talk about you know, kind of how you got your start in poetry, because it's not like you had a bunch of native poets that you could call on, at least on the page, you know, right, right. Can, do you, have, can you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, Jim... And I and Dick Hugo, we were pals. And one of the poems that I wrote, it wasn't for Jim, it was just a poem. Well, it was what I, what I was doing is I was writing and it went on and on and on and on and said this and it said that and it said this and it said that. And then finally, somebody said, you know, those first four lines are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So that poem is called Bad Wine. You can love a dying Indian but when he drinks bad wine and breaks your best glass, you give him to the wind. Those are the four lines. And that's the first, yeah. So, you know, I, Dick and I also, we, well, we did a lot of things together. We drank together. That was one of the big things. You know, one of the, for some reason, well, Dick just lost his wife. He just lost his wife, and he was drinking. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So I was drinking with him, and we were drinking. You know, I've got a poem about it. Maybe I should read that poem. It's, uh, I do that. It's marked. I know it's marked. Oh, it's right here. Letter to Hugo from Dixon. This was the days when we were writing letter poems. And so I thought I'd better write a letter poem. Dear Dick, I was happy when you came to class this summer because I think of you now and borrow time from another time. To tell you the truth warped my tongue yet I can't tell you the truth and be silent. I never did tell you the truth. I could have asked you, friend, how you wrote good poetry as we drank your gin and orange juice those dark, dark, lonesome days. I certainly wasn't your student, but I was, drunk Indian. Another friend showed me, showed poetry I had written in the seminary, stuff I wasn't proud of, but that girl made me feel chaste. We met. You said it wasn't good, awful comes to my mind now. Yet I had something, was that, whether, is that the right word, in one of the poems about my brother on Iwo Jima. You said you didn't say this to old ladies who would never write good poetry. I was your Indian poet those times. 
Yet the only good line I wrote those days that made you laugh hard was Garfield's ghost swims the scalpel hole. And that poem soured fast after that sweet beginning. After we went to Eastern Oregon College, you said that people who wrote the, what were their names, who ran the Mad Virgin Press, would probably print it. Yes, I said, but remain virgin. As evening grew longer, we would change to whiskey and something like 7-Up. I mixed my drinks at the end. I remember leaning hard on the booze, pouring long, hard on the half-gallon jug, then a splash of pop. I was the sneaky Indian. On good nights, we would have those readings off the wall uh, at the beautiful Eddie Avenue house across Bizad. Rocky, Logan, Kaiser, Stafford, good jazz that would make you sing your heart out. We didn't know Welsh yet. I see his name in gold on the desk now, and his reading was fine this summer. Bassett is here in Dixon, helping me remember these times. Poetry from good nights and good drinks, and Dick, you're hot. I wait to visit you very soon. Love, Dick. So, you know, I, those are kind of, I mean, I was that close to Dick and probably not as close to, to Jim. Jim was, you know, he was, a, he came a year after I, I was there and I was going somewhere else. And that, that poem that I read, that four-liner, he was, an upward bound, I think. He was doing upward bound. And uh, that's, and he was just there, and I was there, and I read that poem. So, I think that's all I got to say for now. Do you have something you want to say? I was going to ask you if you had one handy. Mandy and I were on a panel together about letter poems for the Charles M. Russell museum because he wrote letter poems and then would draw on them so yeah i'm glad you're ready because i was <laughs> hoping you would be i didn't even bring a copy of my own book so i borrowed one from fact and fiction and i'm bookmarking because i'm not dog earing with jim's picture where do you stand on that are you a dog ear or are we going to come to I blows prefer stickies okay but sometimes they're just not around uh so um as vic said uh, Hugo, Hugo wrote a lot of letter poems. Many people probably know that. Um, and I think they've inspired many of us to sort of consider, you know, the form and, and how it works. And, you know, I wrote this poem, gosh, 21 or 22 years ago, um, you know, on the other side of Missoula when I was in the writing program here. And just to think about my 23-year-old self <laughs> and and now and, you know, what's happened over that time span is pretty, it just doesn't seem real. Um, but so I wanted to write a poem, a letter poem to Richard Hugo myself. Um, and I, I read this at Jim's memorial 19 years ago. Letter to Richard Hugo, Dick. The reservoir on my end of the state is great for fishing. Some of the banks are tall and jagged. Others are more patient, taking their time as they slope into rocky beaches. If you were the kind of fisherman I imagine, then you might have considered it a great place to cast from. My family has gone up there ever since the water on the Manisho Shea was dammed off. My grandparents put on their moccasins and beadwork and danced for FDR when he rode the train out to see the finishing touches of this great industrial project. I haven't yet decided if this is something I wish to be proud of. Maybe this summer I'll spend more time up there on the edge of a lake that was never meant to be a lake and form an actual opinion. Maybe, too, I'll write you again, but you have already, probably already figured as much. I almost thought of not returning to finish the writing program you began with your own severe desire for language, but I did, 
And now I'm at the end. Already, though, I'll admit to you, I'm thinking of home. I have been this whole time. Once in one of the small cricks that runs from Fort Peck Lake, I saw a catfish swimming upstream, trying to make it back to the shelter of a larger body of water. It was late summer, and there wasn't enough of the crick to cover the top half of his fins. Still, he pushed down into the mud and kept on. I did not envy him, nor did I devise some plan to help him make it back to safety. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about what type of a person this makes me. And since we're on this track, I have a sister I haven't spoken to in years, and the language my relatives spoke while getting ready for the dam's inaugural ceremonies is close to extinction, but I have always made up something more important to do rather than take the risk of saving it. I am still angry at times with my father because I long for the type of mother mine could never have been. I go on mourning her, even though a medicine person has told me it was time to let her go to the other side. I wonder if she is still close, or if years ago she ignored me and went on. I certainly didn't know that today, when I'm a week away from packing up, leaving Missoula for good, and making my way east home, I would sit here in the purplish light of the first real snowfall of the year and write to you. I could go on, tell you about my poetry, about how much it's meant to spend time with Ripley, about the influence Jim has been. Thank you for telling him to write what he knew. That allowed me to write what I know 25 years later from another res a little farther down the road. I'll just close by saying the salmon are plentiful, even if they begin their lives in a hatchery down below the dam. For the time being, I don't mind this as much, and I have an idea you wouldn't either. There's just something about the remissible wave of a cast which feels like the biggest commitment of all. So, Heather, we've kind of inadvertently done little Jim tributes here. Would you like an opportunity to talk about what Jim Welch's work has meant to you as a poet, as a writer, as a creative native person, however? Yeah, so um, I was first influenced by Richard Hugo's. I, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that in our library at my high school we would have <laughs> Hugo, but not Welch. But um, I found making certain it goes on, and um, and I I read it, and I especially love the parts about our reservation, and it's a bad Good Friday, and you know all of these different lines about just driving and just being in that space. And I was thinking, who is this man? Like I have never heard of this guy's name, and he's obviously like famous, and he's like cruising around our reservation and like it, it I I was just really interested but I read his stuff and um that is actually what led me to Welch later but so I first encountered Richard Hugo and um and then in terms of so even though Mandy already did it <laughs> I'll read you my favorite poem of his and um you know I think that He um, is committed to place, and you know where you are when you read his work. You know what he's talking about. Well, I guess if you're from here, you know. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's very similar to how I experience the Montana landscape. Like, it's very raw, it's very powerful, it's, the, there's terseness in his writing, it's, just the essential, you know, that he puts in there. And, um, <laughs> but I, I love this one. It's called My First Hard Springtime. Those red men you offended were my brothers, town drinkers, 
Buckles Pipe, Starboy, Billy Fox were blood to bison. Albert Heavy Runner was never civic. You are white and common. Record Trout in Willow Creek chose me to deify. My horse, centaur, park cayuse was fast and mad and black. Dandy in a flat hat and buckskin, I rode the town and called it mine. A slow, hot wind tumbled dust against my door. Fed and fair, you mocked my philosophic nose, my badger hair. I rolled your deference in the hay and named it love and lasting. Starved to visions, famous cronies, top mount chief, for names to give respect to Blackfeet streets. I could deny them in my first hard springtime, but chose amazed to ride you down with hunger. Yeah. So when you talk about place, and, and this isn't technically place, but there are little things in these poems, and, and it's in all of your work too, like, like reading your book, because, you know, my tribe doesn't have a reservation. So for me, the Flathead Reservation, because that's the place that I've spent the most time with, spent the most time in and know more intimately than I do really anywhere else. You know, so that's kind of my step reservation, I guess you could call it. And but but, you know, there's things so like that poem that Jim, he's talking about Heavy Runner, which just someone who doesn't know it's just a pretty name, right? But, but if you know, you know it was Chief Heavy Runner and his band who were massacred at the Baker Massacre. And Jim's grandmother or great-grandmother was a survivor of that massacre. And I call those things Easter eggs that I think creative writers and particularly poets will thread their work with, kind of the, if you know, you know. So... I just find that whether it's place names or references to coyote stories or things, that's like another level that that I love about people who are like really like dug into a place and can thread their work with it, create special meaning for special people, you know, our relatives, whoever it is who are familiar with these stories. I, I just wanted to point that out as an aside that that that's something that that you all do that is of value to people who maybe don't even realize that they're special because they recognize that. Um, I also want to mention if anybody has questions at any point, I don't necessarily want to wait until it's over to answer questions. So if we're on a theme, feel free to wave your hand and ask a question. Is there anybody right now who's like just saying it to themselves over and over again so you don't forget? No? You're a bunch of cowards. Okay, here we go, Cheryl. Yes, I knew. Is this the same heavy runner at, who was related to Bonnie Heavy Runner, whom the pain family center is dedicated to? It, it might be. I mean, I mean, probably all the heavy runners are related in, one, in, the, in a way. Like my dad would say, there's no other. We're not related to any of the Latres. We're related to all of the Latres. <laughs> You know, so yes, there there are kinship ties. I'm sure that link all. And if correct me if I'm wrong, but I would expect so. Like all those names that show up in Jim's work are people that there are people that you can interact with. Yellow Kidney, you know, who was in Fool's Crow. There are yellow kidneys now, you know, and that's that's one of the. Th and I'm starting to bloviate here. I'm starting to get off the rails, but you know. You get when you ask for somebody to moderate at the last minute. That's what you get. <laughs> when you get through your top dozen choices and you're down into the triple digits, it's where we find ourselves. <laughs> and now I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, yeah, I forgot what I was gonna say. Another question back there. Sure. Here, each of you talk about how 
Mm -hmm. okay. Vic, do you want to take that question on? What's your process like from when you first start writing a poem in draft to edit to finishing it, or do you just like crank it out? What I do is I see something and I try to get it down as closely as I possibly can. And that's the way I write. And so I'll have drafts and drafts and drafts of just one word maybe. I have to change one word. And that's how, you know, that word will get changed. And how I do it is I write in longhand. I don't type. I don't have a computer. I don't have anything like that. I longhand, and I haven't done longhand in a long time. My poetry is in my head right now, and it's not coming out. And I'm hoping that this will start it again. You know, you know po poets have writer's block, they say. I've got writer's block, but I've got a po I've got a poems that I that are in my head that all I have to do is just just write them out but I'm not doing that right now so to write that's how I do it it just start really really tiny just with one word maybe or or just a concept oh this is what it is and then you expand it you expand it you expand it and like I say, that four, that four po four line poem that I wrote, you know, God, that was a long, 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 crazy poem. Until somebody said, you know, those first four lines are the best, and so that's how it became. Those first four lines. So thank you. I'd say, yeah, I've had an extended period of writer's block. 17 years ago, this came out. <laughs> well, there's one in progress, as you can see here, <laughs> all the loose paper. Um, I write, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to find anybody that's traveled more miles across Montana than I have for to visit friends, for work at the state, um, for readings. And I tend to see things or hear things when I'm driving. And I used to be really bad. I'd have like a piece of paper over here and my little, you know, there was like a little hard console and I'd be like. <laughs> uh, I finally realized I should probably pull over, spend a little bit more time. I've tried, I really have to write those first bits down. Um, I've tried to do it on a cell phone when I've had nothing else around and it just, it doesn't feel right. You're like, you know, nothing, it's not the right flow. But then I take my poems and, um, those first beginning little lines and, and images and snippets. And I'll build a poem um, pretty quickly, but I will edit a poem to death. I will not let it go until I feel like every word and every sentence and every stanza is exactly how I want it. So I, I don't know. I, I would say writing, I spend 10% of the time, and then I spend 90% of the time editing it. I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> so usually, or historically, I I write, and I still primarily write on um, those little notebooks you can get anywhere, and it's just lined paper. And I only like to write in blue ink for some reason. I don't like black. <laughs> I don't like any other colors of ink, I don't know why. And I just would just write in blue ink and then I edit in with ink on paper until I feel like I wanna see what form it wants to be and then when I type it, it takes its form. And, um, but I also in the editing process will read it aloud because you don't really know how it will be experienced until you can hear it. And I think poetry, I mean, it's, it's an oral tradition, 
you know? And so I, I feel like when you hear, when you speak, you know, the words, all sound has a frequency. And it, so there's a certain ex way you experience sound. And so I think that's a really important part for me for my editing process is how does it sound in the meter and, you know, all of these different things. But so that's how I used to write. And, um, but I, th I think, you know, I mean, that's how I wrote poetry, not how I wrote like policy papers and stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, I just recently started having to type because I can't write fast enough. So I just got over like a period of, of not really being able to write as regularly as I wanted and as much as I wanted in terms of quantity. Um, and finally, I feel like I found like that channel has opened. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that's... <laughs> Do you type in blue ink too? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> See, I carry these little notebooks, but you'll note that I have a green pen, a blue pen, and a red pen, and a black pen that I coordinate. You know, oh, this little guy sounds green to me, so I'll write him in green. Or, oh, this son of a bitch, he's getting a red. He's getting written in red, so it's a visual thing. I have a little notebook too for writing. I think everybody, when you. When you hear the poetry, it disappears. So you have to capture it. Mm -hmm. Or else, I mean, unless maybe you have like an amazing memory, but there's so much going on and there's so much racket, you know, um, that you, when you hear it, you have to capture it or else it, it disappears back to wherever it's coming from. Mm -hmm. You got a question or you can admonish me for something, Adrian? <laughs> Okay. Um, I guess I can try to talk about this with um, Heather the other night. But um, when did you decide to use like a dispersed native words within the, yeah, your poems and stuff? Is it like a phonetic thing or is it like this, this is the perfect word or mixture? Or? Well, so some of the words I know, well, most of them I know. There's, there's not that much Salish in here, but... Um, you know, it just, I think it just. What oh, makes you decide yeah. when to intersperse like native, like Salish words with, with English on, in the text? Yeah. So a lot of it was, like I, I was saying, just words that I already knew, you know, vocabulary. I mean, growing up, everybody takes Salish in high school. I took Salish at SKC and, um, you know, so everybody can introduce themselves and you can say your colors, you can count, you can, you know, those types of things. And that's really the level of sort of uh, the Salish language that uh, that appears in here. But sometimes I, I was very fortunate um, to have extended family who has been... Um, language speakers and one of one of our elders who passed away was um, Tony Inkashola and he was very dear to me and um, as so I would ask him all the time if I needed to know Salish for something you know what would be the word for this and he would tell me and then other times I just would encounter um, you know just hear stories about words even um, there's a story about um, Sewilku water. Um, so I wrote, wrote about that. Um, yeah, but I also think that in a way that it's important um, to bring, to put that language and embed it in my writing because it is the language that has resonated through this area for thousands and thousands of years. And I think that that resonancy it, it feels different on the landscape than English. And so I think that mm -hmm. it's important to do that. So there's not a lot of Salish in here and a lot of it just, you know, <laughs> common words, common vocab. Um, but I, th yeah, I think that it's important to put that, to pull that in into my writing when I can, when it feels appropriate. Yeah, thank you. So, Heather, you mentioned poetry being an oral communication, oral tradition, and we've the word stories have come out a lot. And I think of 
of Vic talking about the poems just being in his head and how they might emerge orally without ever having, without Vic ever having to pick up a pen again, right? So I tend to tell people, like when I am introduced, I prefer to be called a storyteller and that sometimes I, pref I tell stories through poems or I tell stories through fiction or I tell stories through nonfiction or I will literally just walk out and just start talking about whatever is on my mind as a story. And most people relate to that, but some of like the corduroy mafia style poets, like, like storyteller, no, it's poetry. What do you have to say about specifically that relationship between it existing as shapes on a page versus existing as words that we say to each other that get passed along in that format. Does that make sense? Vic, how about, you know, growing up, how much do you think your poems were influenced by words that you heard from your elders that maybe never ended up on a page anywhere? You know, the, that's what, that's why I write. You know, the things that are, what I think about are the things that are going on in my head are these things in my, in the poem. Um, it's always there. You know, I think I'd like to do a poem, sing a song. Yes. And do that one right now. It's called First Polar Bear. And it's for Chuck Jonkel. But what I do is I say it's for all of us who live here, that try to make it in this world, that it's a great world, but it's a tough world, too. So I think I'll stand up for the song. I don't, I don't think I need that. If my kids want to join in, they can. <laughs> oh, hey, 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 Come centered north as you leave warm reservation to travel unknown trails, guided by knowing you are the center of the universe wherever you are. You try to walk with all beings, knowing you do your best to do what is right. Your feet are light as song, walking bear song, that urges you on, urges you on to country of your ancestors, the Cree and the Chippewa. And walking bear comes finally home. Was it ancient scratches on glacier polished rock granite that told you your ancestors were waiting? Was it high wind that ge geese ride north? Or those owls who sang of the great snowy? Those owls on the tree at your door at old Dixon Agency. You want to paint your face a color mixed with red granite and Hudson's Bay water 
as a sign that you take your place at council fire with bear to talk of relatives to share songs. You remember teacher singing who walking bear was as you scratched your joy deep in smooth, hard stone, and walking bear comes finally home. Oh, hey, oh, hey. to one o'clock here and, and you know unless anybody has a compelling question they have to ask or if there's anything you want to say I think yeah. that is the way to end this thing I mean that that is poetry you know words song spirit you know in Anishinaabe you know we talk about if you live the Anishinaabe life every footstep is a prayer and I think if you live a poetic life every footstep becomes a prayer um and I think Vic just captured that perfectly for us. Thank you, Vic. Anybody? Thank you.